The Cubist Conception of Reality Today, the fact that the aim of the Cubists in the first two phases of their movement was to create a representational art that would present the world in a new manner is largely forgotten. Yet, in 1912, at the very height of the hermetic phase of Cubism, André Samon stated that Courbet was one of the chief inspirers of the new group. In addition, Guillaume Apollinaire, Albert Glies, and Jean Metzinger state explicitly in that year that the Cubist movement is a realist movement, based on the new realism of Courbet. But while the Cubists acclaim the realism of Courbet, they tended very generally to have grave reservations concerning the realism of the Impressionists. For Impressionism seemed to them to lack both the form and formal organization that they felt to be essential to art. Actually, the Impressionists had proposed to deal only with sense phenomena, pure and simple, while rejecting any concern with the intellectual aspects of art. Form, however, is not given directly to the senses, but depends on the formation of mental concepts based on reasoning applied to complexes of sensations. In other words, form exists in the mind as an idea. Now, to the Cubists, the intellectual concept of form was far more real than the ephemeral sensations of the Impressionists. And in regarding an idea as far more real than mere sensations, the Cubists were only reflecting the influence of one of the major philosophical schools of their times. For the end of the 19th century in France saw a great development of the influence of German transcendental metaphysics. At least as early as 1819, Friedrich Hegel has maintained that nature was a formless and chaotic mode of being in which form and other substantial elements existed only in the mind itself. Later, this idea is expressed clearly in its relation to art by Oscar Wilde when he accused nature of being utterly formless and without order. And it is echoed by Guillaume Apollinaire in his book The Cubist Painters, where, speaking for the Cubists, he stated, The order that we find in nature is only the effect of art. Deprived of this order, nature would break up into chaos, and the impotent void would reign everywhere. To the Cubists, ideas, and form among them, always had a higher claim to reality than sense phenomena. For, as Albert Glies and Jean Metzinger put it, a realist will fashion the real in the image of his mind. At the back of this attitude lies the concept based on German idealist philosophy, from Kant to Schopenhauer, that reality as we know it exists, not in the phenomenal world, but only in the world of mind. Kant felt that the thing in itself could never be known, and that the world of appearances was no more than a mode of human representation. Hegel had believed that the only reality was in the world of the mind, and that the phenomenal world was no more than a pale and ephemeral reflection of that reality. Schopenhauer gave the key to his concept of reality in the title of his book The World as Will and Idea, for to him the world of appearances was only the most illusory and ephemeral of all the manifestations of the will, while ideas were the highest. The influence of German thought in France, and especially in the arts, was by no means new with the Cubists. It had already begun to make its effect felt by the beginning of the 19th century. As early as 1808, Madame de Stael had come under the influence of Kant, and in her book De l'Allemagne she devoted a section to the philosophy of Kant. Indeed, the influence of Kant in German thought on the beginnings of the Romantic movement in general is just beginning to be appreciated. By the second half of the 19th century, the influence is seen even more clearly. The poet Stéphane Mallarmé had come in contact with the philosophy of Hegel as a student and remained under the influence of Hegelian concepts all his life. In poetry, he regarded the supreme aim as the search for the pure idea, the Hegelian absolute, while sense phenomena were to be regarded as so much dross from which the pure gold of the idea must be refined. After Mallarmé, the influence of Schopenhauer became stronger, and the end of the century finds much poetry that was strongly influenced by Schopenhauerian pessimism, which was reflected in the attitude that the world of appearances was no better than an illusory dream. Notable as works of art produced on this theme are Villiers de lille Adam's poem Axel, which ends on the note of rejection of the world because its ephemeral reality can never rival the reality of a dream, and Pierre-Louis' Aphrodite, in which the same theme plays a dominant role. In his book, Achebourg, 
Huismont created a character, De Essant, who is the very embodiment of Schopenhauerian pessimism with Nietzschean overtones. For De Essant spends his life rejecting the real world to create an illusory world of sensation, which he regards as superior in every way to the world of nature. Throughout all these philosophical attitudes, there appears the constant rejection of the world of mere appearances as lacking in reality, and the constant claim that reality exists only in the mind as an idea. But there is another concept that is the common mark of all these 19th century philosophies that influence the cubist attitude towards reality. They all assert a belief in a constant element of reality behind the world of mere appearances. Kant had believed in the thing in itself, Hegel had believed in the absolute, and Schopenhauer believed in the absolute reality of the will. This absolute reality, by whatever name it might be called, was believed by all to be absolutely perfect, changeless, timeless, and static. Now it is just in this point that we find the concepts of the cubists differing radically from the ideas of the 19th century, for they believe that reality, or what passes for the reality of the mind, was dynamic. The dynamic concept of reality of the cubists actually has two aspects. The first aspect is the conception that reality changes with the change of ideas of each epoch, while the second is the conception of change itself as the most basic aspect of reality. To take up this first point, the cubists believe that objective reality, which they call the reality intermediate between the consciousness of the individual and the consciousness of others, was constantly changing and that it must be constantly renewed and enlarged by the activity of the artists. Part of this idea of the cubists comes, of course, from the idea of evolutionary progress that so caught the imagination of the 19th century. But the philosophical justification of this attitude was found in the newly developing philosophy of pragmatism. The pragmatists, profoundly affected by the revolutionary changes in thought in the 19th century, especially those in the field of natural science, felt that the search for an absolute truth was fruitless. Turning from the idea of a static truth and reality, they felt constrained to admit that man's concepts of truth and reality change, and that even the so-called laws of science are not necessarily universally valid. For the concept of an absolute truth and reality, they substituted the idea that a concept has reality and truth insofar as it is useful to man in controlling his environment. As John Dewey was eventually to put it, Ideas which do not produce change do not refer to reality. Ideas are true and real, which aid man in understanding and controlling the world about him. From this it follows that different ideas will be effective in different places and in different epochs, depending on the goals sought by each particular culture and period, and that the reality which they reflect will change with the time and place. What passes for reality can no longer be regarded as an absolute, but must be regarded as relative. Actually, in both the cubist aesthetics of the hermetic phase and in pragmatism itself, there is an implication of another sort of reality, a sort of Kantian thing in itself, if one must look for an absolute reality beyond the scope of human knowledge. But the pragmatist maintains that all talk of its absoluteness is meaningless, for the very reason that it lies outside the realm of human experience and cannot be used by man to modify his environment. The cubists, on the other hand, suggest that intuitive intimations of this reality may serve as inspiration to the artist, but it is not the reality they create when they call themselves realists. According to this concept, reality must always be in a process of creation, and the cubists believed it was the artists who were charged with bringing the new reality into being. Startling as this idea may seem in its more extreme form, it is not entirely new, but tends to grow out of the attitudes of transcendental metaphysics of the 19th century. Kant had already stated that our idea of the phenomenal world was a product of man's faculty of understanding. Hegel had maintained that art had a higher claim to reality than the world of mere appearances, because it took on more of the qualities of the mind, while nature was an inferior and imperfect revelation of the absolute, which was given substance only by the mind. In the artistic realm, the background of this idea of the cubists was perhaps best summed up by Oscar Wilde, who stated in his Intentions that Nature is no great mother who has borne us. She is our own creation. Things are because we see them and what we see, and how we see it depends on the arts that have influenced us. What art really reveals to us is nature's lack of design, 
her extraordinary monotony, her absolutely unfinished condition. From the attitude of Wilde, it is only a step to the statement of Apollinaire that the order that we find in nature is only the effect of art. Deprived of this order, nature would break up in chaos, and the impotent void would reign everywhere. The great revolution which Picasso achieved was to make the world his new representation of it. Or again, to the statement of Gliers and Metzinger, before the natural spectacle, the child, in order to coordinate his sensations and subject them to mental control, compares them with his picture book. The man, culture intervening, refers himself to works of art. Here the implication is clear. The idea of reality is a product of art, and as reality is the idea, reality is the creation of the artist. Finally, to return to the other aspect of the dynamic concept of reality of the Cubists, the idea that change is the most basic element of reality, we find that the artist's vision of the universe is essentially Bergsonian. In his book Creative Evolution, published in 1907, Bergson had summed up his conception of the dynamism of the cosmos, which he had been elaborating for a number of years in books such as Matter and Memory and An Introduction to Metaphysics, in the following words. The universe endures. The more we study the nature of time, the more we shall comprehend that duration means invention, the creation of forms, the continual elaboration of the absolutely new. The duration of the universe must therefore be one with the latitude of creation, which can find place in it. The objective of the cubist painter was to control this dynamism, reconstituting objects in time and the immensity of space eternalizing itself in the words of Apollinaire. To the cubist, the universal movement of the universe was constantly modifying the aspects of things, and the universal and ceaseless creation was always creating new objects with the flow of time, for the change with time they regarded as the basic law of the universe. It is interesting to speculate concerning the relationship of the cubist concept of the dynamism of the universe with the theory of relativity and the theory of the equivalence of matter and energy developing in science at the same period. As early as 1905, Einstein had published his theory of relativity, in which he maintained that motion modified the aspect of all things. Actually, this concept of motion modifying the aspect of things had been developed to a considerable extent by Lorentz as early as 1892, and may have fascinated the cubists in much the same way that non-Euclidean or Riemannian geometry did. Actually, the interest in science was one of the basic elements of the Cubist doctrine, even though it was only a source of a broader vision of reality, rather than any exact understanding. This Cubist concept of reality, though it finds its roots deep in the philosophies of the past, is strongly influenced by the vitalism and relativism of the 20th century. It is the acceptance of the concept that reality for man exists only as an idea, that he can know no other reality but that it is a living, changing, progressing idea, an idea of which the central element is life, change, and progress, not a timeless, unchanging, sterile absolute deprived of all human meaning. It is not a reality easily accepted by minds brought up in the tradition of pure idealism, but it is a very stimulating and challenging reality. <laughs>